Ignoring the effects of sets of acts. It is natural to assume the second mistake. If some act is right or wrong because of its effects, the only relevant effects are the effects of this particular act. This assumption is mistaken in at least two kinds of case. In some cases, effects are overdetermined. Consider case one. X and Y simultaneously shoot and kill me. Either shot by itself would have killed. Neither X nor Y acts in a way whose consequence is that an extra person dies. Given what the other does, it is true of each that if he had not shot me, this would have made no difference. According to C6, neither X nor Y harms me. Suppose that we make the second mistake. We assume that if an act is wrong because of its effects, the only relevant effects are the effects of this particular act. Since neither X nor Y harms me, we are forced to the absurd conclusion that these two murderers do not act wrongly. Some would take this case to show that we should reject C6. There is a better alternative. We should add C7. Even if an act harms no one, this act may be wrong because it is one of a set of acts that together harm other people. Similarly, even if some act benefits no one, it can be what someone ought to do because it is one of a set of acts that together benefit other people. X and Y act wrongly because they together harm me. They together kill me. C7 should be accepted even by non-consequentialists. On any plausible moral theory, it is a mistake in this kind of case to consider only the effects of single acts. On any plausible theory, even if each of us harms no one, we can be acting wrongly if we together harm other people. In case one, the overdetermining acts are simultaneous. What should we claim in cases where this is not true? Consider case two. X tricks me into drinking poison of a kind that causes a painful death within a few minutes. Before this poison has any effect, Y kills me painlessly. Though Y kills me, Y's act is not worse for me. C6 therefore implies that, in killing me, Y does not harm me. Y's act is in one way slightly worse for me since it shortens my life by a few minutes. But this is outweighed by the fact that Y saves me from a painful death. C6 also implies that X does not harm me. As in case 1, neither X nor Y harms me. But C7 implies correctly that X and Y act wrongly because they together harm me. They together harm me because if both had acted differently, I would not have died. Though C7 gives the right answer here, this case may seem to provide an objection to C6. It may seem absurd to claim that in killing me, Y is not harming me. But consider case 3. As before, X tricks me into drinking poison of a kind that causes a painful death within a few minutes. Y knows that he can save your life if he acts in a way whose inevitable side effect is my immediate and painless death. Because Y also knows that I am about to die painfully, 
y acts in this way. C6 implies that y ought to act in this way since he will not harm me and he will greatly benefit you. This is the right conclusion. Since Y's act is not worse for me, it is morally irrelevant that Y kills me. It is also morally irrelevant that X does not kill me. C6 implies correctly that X acts wrongly. Though X does not kill me on the ordinary use of kill, he is here the real murderer. X harms me and acts wrongly because it is true that if he had not poisoned me, Y would not have killed me. If X had acted differently, I would not have died. Y does not harm me because if Y had acted differently, this would have made no difference to whether I died. Since Y does not harm me, and he greatly benefits you, Y is doing what he ought to do. As these remarks show, case 2 provides no objection to case to C6. In case 3, C6 correctly implies that Y ought to act as he does, because he does not harm me. In case 2, Y's act affects me in just the same way. I was therefore right to claim that in case 2, Y does not harm me. Y acts wrongly in case 2 because he is intentionally a member of a group who together harm me. It may be objected that if this is Y in case 2, Y acts wrongly, Y must be acting wrongly in case 3. It may be thought that here too, Y is intentionally a member of a group who together harm me. This objection shows the need for another claim. In case 3, it is true that if both X and Y had acted differently, I would not have been harmed. But this does not show that X and Y together harm me. It is also true that if X, Y, and Fred Astaire had all acted differently, I would not have been harmed. But this does not make Fred Astaire a member of a group who together harm me. We should claim C8. When some group together harm or benefit other people, this group is the smallest group of whom it is true that if they had all acted differently, the other people would not have been harmed or benefited. In case 3, this group consists of X. It is true of X that if he had acted differently, Y would have done so too, and I would not have been harmed. No such claim is true of Y. In case 2, it is not true of either X or Y that if he had acted differently, I would not have been harmed. I would not have been harmed only if both had acted differently. I would also not have been harmed if X, Y, and Fred Astaire had acted differently. But C8 rightly excludes Fred Astaire from the members of the group who together harm me. This group consists only of X and Y. Consider next the third rescue mission. As before, if four people stand on a platform, this will save the lives of 100 miners. Five people stand on this platform. Given what the others do, it is true of each of these five people that his act makes no difference. If he had stood on this platform, the other four would have saved the 100 miners, though none by himself makes any difference. These five together save the 100 miners. This case shows the need to add some further claims to C8. In this case, there is not one smallest group who together save the 100 lives. I shall return to such cases in section 30. There is a second kind of case in which we should consider the effects of sets of acts. These are 
coordination problems. One example is a 4 by 4 matrix. If you do 1 and I do 1, this produces the second best result. If you do 2 but I do 1, the result is bad. If you do 1 but I do 2, the result is bad. If you do 2 and I do too, the result is best. Suppose that we apply consequentialism only to single acts. We shall then claim that each has successfully followed C if he has done the act of those that are possible for him, whose consequence is the best outcome. But as we saw earlier, in coordination problems, C will then be indeterminate. In this case, we successfully follow C both if we do two and if we both do one. Suppose that we both do one. Given what you have done, I have done the act whose consequence is best. The outcome would have been worse if I had done two. The same claims apply to you. If we both do one, both successfully follow C but we have not produced the best possible outcome. Consequentialists should thus claim C9. Suppose that each of us has made the outcome as good as he can, given what the others did. Each has then acted rightly, but we together may have acted wrongly. This will be so if we together could have made the outcome better. This is a claim about objective rightness, or what will in fact make the outcome best. If C includes this claim, it ceases to be indeterminate in this case. When we are deciding what to do, we should ask instead what is subjectively right or what will be likely, given our beliefs, to make the outcome best. In most coordination problems of this kind, it is subjectively right for each of us to aim at the best outcome, since this is what others are likely to do.